Hi everyone, it's Cassie, the Young Teen Librarian at East Hampton Library. Tonight we are continuing with reading through Cheaper by the Dozen, and we are continuing with Chapter 5, Mr. Chairman. Dad was born in Fairfield, Maine, when his father ran a general store, farmed, and raised harness racing horses. John Hiram Gilbreth died in 1871, leaving his three-year-old son, two older daughters, and a stern and rock-bound widow. Dad's mother, Grandma Gilbreth, believed that her children were fated to make important marks in the world, and that her first responsibility was to educate them so they would be prepared for their rendezvous with destiny. After that, she told her Fairfield neighbors with a knowing nod, blood will tell. Without any business ties to hold her in Maine, she moved to Andover, Massachusetts so that the girls could attend Abbott Academy. Later, when her oldest daughter showed a talent for music, Grandma Gilbreth decided to move again. Every New Englander, every New Englander knew the location of the universe's seat of culture, and it was to Boston that she now journeyed with her flock. Dad wanted, more than anything else, to be a construction engineer and his mother planned to have him enter Massachusetts Institute of Technology. By the time he finished high school though, he decided this would be too great a drain on the family finances and would interfere with his sister's studies. Without consulting his mother, he took a job as a bricklayer's helper. Once the deed was done, Grandma Gilbreth decided to make the best of it. After all, Mr. Lincoln had started by splitting rails but if you're going to be a bricklayer's helper, she said, for mercy's sake, be a good bricklayer's helper. I'll do my best to find a good bricklayer to help, Dad grinned. If Grandma thought Dad was going to be a good helper, his new foreman thought he was the worst he had encountered in 40 years, man and boy of bricklaying. During Dad's first week at work, he made so many suggestions about how brick could be laid faster and better that the foreman threatened repeatedly to fire him. You're the one who came here to learn, the foreman hollered at him. For Christ's sake, don't try to learn us. Subtle innuendos like that never worried Dad. Besides, he already knew that motion study was his element, and he had discovered something that apparently had never attracted the attention of industry before. He tried to explain it to the foreman. Did you ever notice that no two men use exactly the same way of laying bricks, he asked? That's important, and do you know why? I know that if you open your mouth about bricklaying again, I'll lay a brick in it. It's important because if one bricklayer is doing the job the right way, then all the others are doing the job the wrong way. Now, if I had your job, I'd find who's laying brick the right way and make all the others copy him. If you had my job, shouted the livid-faced foreman, the first thing you'd do is fire the red-headed, unprintable son of a ruptured, deleted who, who tried to get your job. And that's what I think you're trying to do. He picked up a brick and waved it menacingly. I may not be smart enough to who, know who my best bricklayer is, but I know who my worst hod carrier is. I'm warning you, stop bothering me or this brick goes in your mouth, edgewise. Within a year, Dad designed a scaffold that made him the fastest bricklayer on the job. The principle of the scaffold was that loose bricks and mortar always were at the level, at the level of the top of the wall being built. The other bricklayers had to lean over to get their materials. Dad didn't. You ain't smart, the foreman scoffed. You're just too goddamn lazy to squat. But the foreman had identical scaffolds built for all the men on the job and even suggested that dad send the original to the Mechanics Institute, where it won a prize. Later on the foreman's recommendation, dad was made foreman of a crew of his own. He achieved such astonishing speed records that he was promoted to superintendent and then went into the contracting business for himself, building bridges, canals, industrial towns, and factories. Sometimes after the contract work was finished, he was asked to remain on the job to install his motion study methods within the factory itself. By the time he was 27, he had offices in New York, Boston, and London. He had a yacht, smoked cigars, and had a reputation as a snappy dresser. Mother came from a well-to-do family in Oakland, California. 
She had met Dad in Boston while she was en route to Europe on one of those well-chaperoned tours for fashionable young ladies of the 90s. Mother was a Phi Beta Kappa and a psychology graduate of the University of California. In those days, women who were scholars were viewed with some suspicion. When mother and dad were married, the Oakland paper said, Although a graduate of the University of California, the bride is nonetheless an extremely, an extremely attractive young woman. Indeed, she was. So it was mother the psychologist and dad the motion study man and general contractor who decided to look into the new field of the psychology of management and the, and the old field of psychology psychologically managing a household of houseful of children. They believed that what would work in the home would work in the factory, and what would work in the factory would work in the home. Dad put the theory to test shortly after we moved to Montclair. The house was too big for Tom Greaves, the handyman, and Mrs. Cunningham, the cook, to keep in order. Dad decide, decided we were going to have to help them, and he wanted us to offer the help of our own accord. He had found that the best way to get cooperation out of employees in a factory was to set up a joint employer employee board, which would make work assignments on a basis of personal choice and aptitude. He and mother set up a family council patterned after an employer employee board. The council met every Sunday afternoon immediately after dinner. At the first session, dad got to his feet formally, poured a glass of ice water and began a speech. You will notice, he said, that I am installed here as your chairman. I assume there are no objections. The chair, hearing no objections, will. Mr. Chairman, Anne interrupted. Being in high school, she knew something of parliamentary procedure and thought it might be a good idea to have the chairman represent the common people. Out of order, said Dad, very much out of order when the chair has the floor. But you said you heard no objections and I want to object. Out of order means sit down and you're out of order, Dad shouted. He took a swallow of ice water and resumed his speech. The first job of the council is to apportion necessary work in the house and yard. Does the chair hear any suggestions? There were no suggestions. Dad forced a smile and attempted to radiate good humor. Come, come, fellow members of the council, he said. This is a democracy. Everybody has an equal voice. How do you want to divide the work? No one wanted to divide the work or otherwise be associated with it in any way, shape, or form. So no one said anything. In a democracy, everybody speaks, said Dad. So by jingo, start speaking. The good humor man was gone, was gone now. Jack, I recognize you. What do you think about dividing the work? I'd warn you, you better think of something. I think, Jack said slowly, that Mrs. Cunningham and Tom should do the work. They get paid for it. Sit down, Dad hollered. You are no longer recognized. Jack sat down amid general appro approval, except that of Dad and Mother. Hush, Jackie, M Mother whispered. They may hear you and leave. It's so hard to get servants when there are so many children in the house. I wish they would leave, said Jack. They're too bossy. Dad was next, da Dan was next recognized by the chair. I think Tom and Mrs. Cunningham have enough to do, he said as dad and mother beamed and nodded agreement. I think we should hire more people to work for us. Out of order, dad shouted. Sit down and be quiet. Dad saw things weren't going right. Mother was the psychologist. Let her work them out. Your chairman recognizes the assistant chairman, he said, nodding to mother to let her know he had just conferred that title upon her person. We could hire additional help, mother, mother said, and that might be the answer. We grinned and nudged each other. But, she continued, that would mean cutting the budget somewhere else. If we cut out all desserts and allowances, we could afford a maid. And if we cut out moving pictures, ice cream sodas, and new clothes for a whole year, we could afford a gardener, too. Do I hear a motion to that effect, Dad beamed. Does anybody want to stop allowances? No one did. After some prodding from dad, the motion on allotting work finally was introduced and passed. The boys would cut the grass and rake the leaves. The girls would sweep dust and do the supper dishes. 
Everyone except dad would make his own bed and keep his room neat. When it came to apportioning work on an aptitude basis, the smaller girls were assigned to dust the legs and lower shelves of furniture, the older girls to dust tabletops and upper shelves. The older boys would push the lawn mowers and carry leaves. The younger ones would do the raking and weeding. The next Sunday, when dad convened the second meeting of the council, we sat self-consciously around the table, biding our time. The chairman knew something was in the air and it tickled him. He had trouble keeping a straight face when he called for new business. Martha, who had been carefully coached in pri private caucus, arose. It has come to the attention of the membership, she began, that the assistant chairman intends to buy a new rug for the dining room. Since the entire membership will be required to look upon and sit in chairs resting upon the rug, I move that the council be consulted before any rug is purchased. Second the motion, said Anne. Dad didn't know what to make of this one. Any discussion, he asked, in a, in a move designed to kill time while he planned his counterattack. Mr. Chairman, said Lillian, we have to sweep it. We should be able to choose it. We want one with flowers on it, Martha put, on, put in. When you have flowers, the crumbs don't show so easily, and you save motions by not having to sweep so often. We want to know what sort of rug the assistant chairman intends to buy, said Ernestine. We want to make sure the budget can afford it, Fred announced. I recognize the assistant chairman, said Dad. This whole council business was your idea anyway, Lily. What do we do now? Well, Mother said doubtfully, I had planned to get a plain violet covered rug and I had planned to spend a hundred dollars. But if the children think that's too much and if they want flowers, I'm willing to let the majority rule. I move, said Frank, that not more than $95 be spent. Dad shrugged his shoulders. If mother didn't care, he certainly didn't. So many as favor the motion to spend only $95 signify by saying aye. The motion carried unanimously. Any more new business? I move, said Bill, that we spend the $5 we have saved to buy a collie puppy. Hey, wait a minute, said Dad. The rug had been somewhat of a joke, but the dog question was serious. We had wanted a dog for years. Dad thought that any pet which didn't lay eggs was an extravagance that a man with 12 children could ill afford. He felt that if he surrendered on the dog question, there was no telling what the council might vote, on, might vote next. He had a sickening mental picture of a barn full of ponies, a roadster for Anne, motorcycles, a swimming pool, and ultimately the poorhouse or a debtor's prison, if they still had such things. Second the motion, said Lillian, yanking Dad out of his reverie. A dog, said Jack, would be a pet. Everyone in the family could pat him, and I would be his master. A dog, said Dan, would be a friend. He would eat scraps of food, he would save us waste, and would save motions for the garbage man. A dog, said Fred, said Fred, would keep burglars away. He would sleep on the foot of my bed, and I would wash him whenever he was dirty. A, a dog, Dad mimicked, would be an accursed nuisance. He would be our master. He would eat me out of house and home. He would spread fleas from the garret to the porte cochere. He would, he would be positive he would be positive to sleep on the foot of my bed. Nobody would wash his filthy, dirty, flea-bitten carcass. He looked pleadingly at Mother. Lily, Lily, open your eyes, he implored. Don't you see where this is leading us? Ponies, roadsters, trips to Hawaii, silk stockings, rouge, and bobbed hair. I think, dear, said Mother, that we must rely on the good sense of the children. A five-dollar dog is not a trip to Hawaii. We voted, and there was only one negative ballot. Dad's. Mother abstained. In after years, as the collie grew older, shed hair on the furniture, bit the mailman, and did in fact try to appropriate the foot of Dad's bed, the chairman was heard to remark on occasion to the assistant chairman, I give nightly praise to my maker that I never cast a, ba cast a ballot to bring that lazy, disreputable, ill-tempered beast into what was once my home. I'm glad I had the courage to go on record as opposing that illegitimate, shameless flea bag that now shares my bed and board. You abstainer, you. And that is the end of chapter five. And tomorrow night we will continue with chapter six.
Have a good night, everyone.